Yes, hello everyone. Welcome to the live stream. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to get yourself back on track if you've been overeating for a couple of weeks or binge eating. Similar to me, I just got back from a two week trip in Italy where I really overindulged myself. You know, I'm really sorry for the late start. I had so many te technical issues, even though I've done this like a hundred times. First, I couldn't get the sound to work, I had to change my interface, use a different audio face, and then I went live. I did something a little different this time. I w I'm trying to trying to go live a little different on Facebook, and initially, I went live on Facebook and no one was there, so I had to reboot the whole thing. So sorry for the late start. I think this is only now being broadcast on uh, YouTube. So you know, give me a thumbs up if you don't mind. It'll help other people see it. Share it with anyone you think it might help. But let me pop up the slide that kind of explained exactly what I'm going to be talking about today. I had an incredible time in Italy, like mind blowing. I was in Italy, Italy twice this year. I know you guys were following me. I think Jeff is here. Let's see what we got. Meantime, I got to see pasta on the screen. <laughs> and I'm fasting. Hey, yeah, sorry about that, Jeff. I know exactly how you feel. You know, sorry for the late start. I wouldn't show what type of a like thumbnail he used to describe this live stream today. So I figured I'd go with a nice big bowl of pasta. And it's interesting because we were in northern, northern Italy, you know, like we flew into Milan. And then we went to like Lake Como, we we're in a town called Cusi, Parma, where Parmesan cheese is from. So I tried to pick a pasta that was more like um, localized, meaning like Northern Italy is known more for their cheeses as opposed to like Southern Italy, which I kind of prefer is more like the red sauces, but kind of interesting. So I think that thumbnail was kind of on the mark. Hey Patel, thanks for showing up. Hey Mike, you're looking well after the holiday. Yeah, thanks, I really appreciate it. And I had a, it was a lot of fun, but you know, when you go to, when you go to Europe, even though it was so much fun, it's still exhausting, right? Six hour time difference. You know, the general rule is for every hour, there's a time difference, it takes you a day to get yourself like back on track. So I'm, I'm still a little tired, but I've been trying to work on my circadian rhythm and all that, which we're gonna talk about here. Oh, thanks for showing up, glad you're back. Now I really appreciate it, and yeah. So nice of you to show up. Okay, so let's talk about what I'll talk about today. And of course, Harriet is here. Good to have you back. Yes, I really appreciate it, Harriet, thanks so much. So that's what we're going to talk about. I always generally, even when I'm just taking like a local trip, like the Hamptons or to the beach, I always like to go on vacation, you know, kind of in like a good place, kind of a little bit lighter. So I'll talk about my pre-vacation, my pre-workout diet. Oh, yes. Hey, thanks for showing up. I really appreciate it. Then we'll talk about what I planned on doing on this trip. Like I had this whole plan in my head that I'm, I'm going to still enjoy myself, but I'm going to like not gain any weight, I'm gonna to try to control myself a little bit, and I started out doing that and then it just fell apart. So we'll talk about that. Then I wanna show you the wedding. I'll, I'll, I'll show you the bride and the groom. I'll show you some of, um, some of I don't know if Jeff is gonna like this, but I'll, I'll show you some of the meals we we're eating, incredible food in Italy. I'll show you some of my favorite meals that we had you know, along the trip. I didn't do too, too many scenery uh, uh, pictures. I, I took a couple of shots to show you from Lake Como, which I think is the prettiest place because we're high up in the mountains overlooking the lake and um, I can't tr quite figure out the real estate in Italy because I have to say we stayed in a lot of B&Bs that were so reasonable something like a hundred euros 125 euros and they were like really nice pretty like um, one bedroom apartments the one in Lake Coma had this terrace overlooking Lake Coma literally a quarter mile from where George Clooney has his place even though you can't really go around this place you get fined if you go anywhere near it so we didn't, obviously we didn't see him, we didn't see his place, but it was, that's the general area we were in when we were in Lake Como. And then I'll talk about right now, like what my post vacation diet and workout reset is. That's kind of be like the gist of this um, live stream. I'm already feeling so much better. I think today's my day five, I think. And I'm already, I've been so good since I've been back. I haven't had an ounce of wine, but eating like perfectly and walking twice a day. But I'll go over that in great detail. Well, let's talk about like what I, first we'll fall, talk about like my pre-vacation. This is what I generally like to do most of the time, you know, whenever I go away, even if it's just a couple of weeks at the beach or whatever, I always like to go away two or three pounds lighter. So what I do, I always tighten up the diet like, like a, a week or so, even if it's just five days right before I go on a trip. You know, I don't, I don't go too crazy. Like I don't really necessarily do OMAD or do anything too crazy. I just kind of like cut back on calories. I go really low on carbohydrates because I want to deplete my muscles from that stored glycogen. Like I talked about in the past, when you eat carbohydrates, whatever carbs you're not burning up at that moment, gets stored away in the muscle and the liver in the form of glycogen. 
for every gram of carbohydrates you store in the muscles, you're going to hold about maybe two, three, four grams of water. So you always have like two or three gram, uh, two or three, maybe four pounds of water weight, depending upon how big you are in your body when your muscles are full with glycogen. So I like to like really deplete my glycogen stores before I go go away by eating very low carb for a few days because I know that when I'm going to Italy, I'm going to be eating pasta and pizza and things like that, which I did. So I went on the trip probably in a mild state of ketosis. And ketosis just means that my liver is like converting body fat into ketone bodies. And I felt flat, meaning that I can tell my veins were flat, you know, I, I was feeling fine because I dip in out of ketosis from time to time, but that's how I like to enter the trip. And that, actually, that worked great. <laughs> Everything I said I was going to do, I did. You know, I ate almost next to nothing on the plane. I think the worst thing you could do is start drinking wine on the plane and eating, uh, you know, that horrible plane food. I think I took a Quest protein bar. I just had that on the plane, drank a lot of, like, coffee, and I took my Pellegrino mineral water, which I bought at the airport. So I arrived in Italy, you know, tired because, you know, you wake up, you, you arrive in the morning. But I was light, two, three pounds lighter, probably in a mild state of ketosis, glycogen levels really, really low. And this was going to be my plan of how I was going to like deal with this whole Italy trip for two weeks. I think it was there 12, 13 days. I didn't want to come back too out of shape and gain too much weight. So this was going to be my plan. I was going to walk every single day, like first thing in the morning. Now, when we, when we went to Rome, because my daughter did... A semester in Rome you know a few months ago it was so easy for me to do this because you know Rome is like living in it's like New York City you know you can just walk out of your place and just it's flat it's it's easy to walk unfortunately this trip was nothing like that obviously Lake Como you're up in the hills I mean it's almost dangerous to walk because people are driving like crazy the roads are really narrow it was really challenging <laughs> Driving in Italy. I don't know if you ever seen that movie European European Vacation with um with Chevy Chase. Remember that movie where he gets into one of those traffic circles? He's driving in the circle, like two days go by, he can't get out of the circle. It's really hysterical. That's how I felt. It makes sense because with traffic circles there were no stoplights, but it's amazing the personality changes I find from it like like native Italians. Like you'll take an eighty year old guy who's like a nice guy walking slowly on the street. You put him behind the wheel of a car, he's an inch off your bumper. I mean, it's unreal. They drive so aggressive in Italy. So that was a little challenge. So it was really, really hard, especially with my knee, because my knee is not great going downhill. It was really, really hard for me to get my walks in. I was so disappointed with that. It just wasn't a trip like that. We were driving everywhere. We had a lot of events with the wedding. I only walked one day. We stayed in this like balsamic vinegar place, a hotel. It was really like a, kind of like a and b where they make balsamic vinegar. Really in interesting place. And it was flat there and I loved it. I think I posted a couple of stories on that when I was walking. So I walked for like an hour and a half. I got one day of walking in. So there we go. The, the, diet, the, the exercise plan was just totally out the window. Hey, Chris is here. You walk, watching on Facebook. Good, Chris. You know, I didn't think I went out on Facebook, but I guess I did. I don't know. I don't know what I did there. I messed it up. I had to reboot the whole thing. Hey, hey, Morgan, thanks for showing up. Really nice of you to be here. So unfortunately, the workout plan did not go. Okay, now this was my diet plan and fasting plan, and I kind of stuck to it for the beginning of the trip. Like, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to one day just eat anything I want. Because the great thing about Italy, you wake up in the morning, I, like, I, mean, I, I typically drink espresso or black coffee you know, when I'm home, but you know, in Italy, I, it's nice to have cappuccino, you know, that's when they foam the milk. And I didn't realize this, but after 12 o'clock, it's hard to get cappuccino in Italy because people in, in Italy only drink cappuccino in the morning. If you show up to like, you know, two o'clock, right before the restaurant closes for lunch, you want a cappuccino, they didn't even want to give it to you. They only want to give you espresso, which is kind of interesting. So I planned on having my cappuccino and then like one day eat anything I want, have two good meals, Maybe even, you know, just really enjoying myself. I drank, I drank a ton of red wine. And then the second day, I said, let me do the old mad diet. I'm only going to eat one meal a day, even if it's just a pizza. Like I posted a story on Instagram showing that I did that. I did the old mad diet. I kind of even broke the old mad diet. I still would drink a little bit of wine, <laughs> which maybe wasn't a good idea on an empty stomach. And then I would have like just maybe a big pizza for dinner and some other like appetizer type things. And I did that. Maybe I did that for about five days. First of all, everybody thought I was crazy. They're on my case, like, Mike, what is wrong with you? You can't, you're in Italy. You can't live it, like, be like a normal person. It's only two weeks, eat what you want. You're in good shape. 
So after about five days, six days of doing that, I just threw the towel in and then I just was pretty much eating pretty much whatever I wanted. I, I almost got tired of drinking so much red wine though. I kind of cut back on the wine towards the, towards the end of the, uh, towards the end of the trip. But so, you know, it didn't go, it did not go as planned, but Hey, it was an incredible trip. It just like the diet and the exercise program didn't go as planned, but it just happens on these trips. So I had an incredible time, but let, let me talk about, let me talk about the wedding and I have a whole bunch of pictures. I'll show you the bride and groom. And I'll show you some of my favorite meals. Like once again, the wedding was incredible, amazing food, kind of interesting. The young people that got married, um, and we recently, about three years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, I went to another wedding. This is, uh, and this was my wife's side of the family, this wedding. And the wedding we went to about two and a half years ago, maybe two years ago, this was my wife's best friend's daughter. All these young people, like in their late 20s, early 30s, who were, or were successful, seem to go to this event called Burning Man. I've never ever heard about it. Burning Man to me right, is it kind of like a spiritual get together type thing. There's a lot of like yoga and spirituality and, and it's kind of an interesting thing. It's very expensive to go to. It reminds me people get dressed up in these wild outfits and costumes. It reminds me of like Rocky how Rocky Horror, Rocky Horror Picture Show, how they dress there. Everyone dressed like that. And this was a very similar crowd of young people to the other wedding I went to. They're all like good looking, successful people in the 30s, really fun. I, I would say it's the kind of crowd that like parties hard and works hard. You know, like when they were off though, they're having a lot of fun. So it was really fun being around the people, these young people in the wedding. But it's so weird now that I'm 60, I'm like the old, we're like the old group. We even stayed at a different hotel than most of the young people stayed who were like actually in the wedding. It's, it's just a weird transition for me, but I loved it. I mean, it was just like a three day wedding. The first day we had um, a rehearsal dinner, and this is in Cruzi, like kind of like a small town. I don't know, maybe a couple hours out of Milan. We flew into Milan, and then the next day we had um, like a wine tasting at this like really nice vineyard, and then the third day was the actual wedding. Um, and I guess I'm talking about how I felt. I fell off the wagon on this, but let, let me show you some pictures. I'll, I'll show you a picture of the bride and groom here. Let me see. Where are all my pictures? Let me go back to the slide, and then I'll pull these pictures up. Uh oh, did I lose my picture? That would be horrible if I did. Let me see where they are. I think it's, um, are they here? Let's see. Oh my goodness. If not, I can still pull them up. It's going to take me a little bit longer to do it. Well, let me see where the wedding. That's weird. I don't, I don't see my picture. Okay, I'm going to pull them up because I have them all in my computer. I just have to pull them in one at a time. Let me show you the bride and groom first if I can find them here. I know I have them all. Okay, I guess when I upload, when I change the upload, I lost the photos. I'm going to lose my meals too, but I'll pull them all in. So this is the bride and groom. This is my wife's cousin. Really attractive couple. Super fun. Super successful couple. The wedding was actually outside. Kind of, I don't know, I would describe it like the woods forest, but like perfect temperature, beautiful sunny day. Maybe it was... I don't know, 70 degrees. We see how pretty, you know, how pr pretty it was. This is right after the ceremony. They did the ceremony outside, and this is where we were having the um, the actual, like, main meal for the wedding. But it was a great buffet. Everyone's drinking those, what are those drinks? Aponeurosis, you know those drinks with, a, is like, um, you know those orange drinks with oranges in them. I think it's a combination of, of um, Prosecco, which is like a sparkling wine with um, oranges in it. A little, a little like club soda salsa and ab abarona, which is like a you know kind of like an orangey, um, low alcohol type drink. But it was great. It was great. Let's see, what we got. Did you lose the pictures, Mike? Yeah, you know, I think I they, I lost them from because it's interesting because I I tried to go live like on time, like right at twelve o'clock. There was no there was no sound. I couldn't get the sound to work, and it wasn't going out on Facebook. So it took me a while to to fix the whole thing. But I, I'm gonna have to pull all the pictures in from um, like how I normally would do it. So let me show you like, like for example, some of the meals, some of my favorite meals. I thought the best meals of the trip was in Parma. So Parma is where like Parmesan cheese is made. First we flew into Milan and the first town we stayed in for a day or two was Parma. And this is the stuff that I like. At first I was trying to keep an eye on the carbohydrates, but I love all these, um, these cocoa type things, and you know, like the prosciutto, the gava gold, the super sasa. We had a whole thing like that. I don't know if you can see these little puff. These in the back of it, Palm is also known for these like bread where they they almost it's like almost like pizza free, like a fried dough, but much more lighter, and they puff up. 
it was incredible. What was so nice about this restaurant is, first of all, when you go into the small towns, less people speak English. So we pulled into the town. We asked the gal who we're, we're renting the B&B from, like, what's your favorite restaurant? She gave us two names. This was the first one. We go there. No one's there. Just this old guy. And I felt bad for the guy because I didn't know what was going on with him. He must have just had spinal surgery. He had this whole brace on him. <laughs> it was like crazy. So he, uh, you know, he's trying to understand what we want. He brings his wife out, who's the cook, the chef, out of the kitchen. She spoke English a little better. And she just said, sit down guys i'm gonna make everything for you meaning that she started us out with this you know the wine there is crazy cheap you buy a bottle of wine for like three or four euros literally of the local wine and it's actually good so she gave us like a little craft of red a little craft of white my wife drinks white i drink red and she started us out with like this antipasta and then she said i'm gonna make you a sampling of all the different raviolis and i, I think i took a picture of that too i think i have that picture let me show you the raviolis. See, normally when I pull these pictures in, I already shrunk them in size. See, these are all the different raviolis that's sampling. And see, you can see this puffy bread. This is a better picture of it. So they gave us some pasta here, some raviolis. I have to say, it was incredibly good. I absolutely loved it. This was actually, besides the wedding, the, wed the wedding was a Michelin star restaurant, which the food was excellent too. But these, this was probably these two places. And the second place was very similar, was probably my favorite food. But you can already tell I'm carving up and you know, but the interesting thing is like when you go, when I go away, like say, when I'm in a state of ketosis and I'm flat, that means my muscles and my liver are low in glycogen. As soon as I carb up for a couple of days, you look and I look and felt incredible because I gained three, four pounds of like water weight within my muscles and makes me look muscular. You know, my veins, you know, start popping out. I just feel great. But then by the third or fourth day, you just feel like you're gaining weight, you know, but I love, um, it's almost like doing like a, a carb loading type thing. Uh, let's see. Okay, my Italian is non-existent, being half Italian. Oh, that's me too. Me, same thing. Only Dutch English. Some oh, that's good. But you can have German. In it. That's awesome. Italians can make delicious meals. Italians can make meals delicious with the simplest of ingredients. That's the art, and I totally, totally agree. Let me show you some of my other favorite meals. This was a really interesting meal. I love this. See, I, it's almost my, I always talk about, I always talk about trigger foods. And one of my trigger foods is eggplant Parmesan. And the crazy thing about Italy is that, for example, when you're, you know, I mean, in New York or New Jersey, like you're driving on the New Jersey Turnpike, this is like, like that's the main road, like in New York or, and you know, you pull over for gas and then you go to like, you know, the rest stop to buy, to get food. And there's like, mcdonald's burger king <laughs> you know like wednesday just total you know fast food nothing when you stop in italy at like one of those like auto places you get food like this this was actually a bicycle shop where they would sell sold bicycles and rented and rented bicycles they also had incredible coffee cappuccino and they had a gal in the back cooking this was one of the best meals i had in all of italy it was like seven euros which is unreal and this was eggplant parmesan. I love eggplant parmesan when it's not breaded with a little. I mean, it was an incredible meal. And it was like next to nothing. It, it was like unreal. That's the amazing thing about Italy. You get great food. Egg palm. Wow, that looks, you know, it, it was it was incredible, Chris. And that's my that's my stock. I'm always looking at carbs. I like it without the, um, I personally like it without the breading. This is the day when I started off doing my OMAD. You know, they have that real, like that real thin, you know, um, margarita type pizza. Here's just an example of a pizza. Once again, also something like eight euros for this pizza. This is the day when I did all mad. I only had a pizza, which was like early in the trip. I, don't, I forget even what town that was. Let me see. I think I got a couple of, I don't want to like torture you guys with all these different food, all the different food. But um, let me show you one. I'll show you two more. This was just a chicken dish, just a nice chicken, just great incredible place i'll show you one more and then we'll move on because i don't want to torture anyone there's another pizza that was just incredible this pizza and this is more my style of pizza i like pizza that's very saucy thin crispy and light on the cheese so this pizza was just like mind-blowing i just this was my favorite pizza of of the whole trip and i think this was in um in lake como actually which is really cool let me i think i got a couple of pictures maybe one or two pictures of Lake Como and then and then we'll just move on like this this example this is the room that we rented a B&B &B, like I said in Lake Como like two minutes I don't know two minutes four or five minutes from 
George Clooney, but you can kind of get a feel for how high up we were. This is only the beginning. There were so many like winding roads going down. And this is like the balcony of the B&B we stayed at like Coma. And it was like dirt, it was crazy cheap. I think under $150 a night. And it was a nice one bedroom. It's, it's, it's shockingly how affordable it is once you get to Italy. Like flying there could be expensive. I think we flew Delta, which was more expensive. Last time we flew um, Air Italia, like the Italian airlines, but I, I didn't think it was anywhere as nice. I thought Delta did a much better job, but it was half the price. We just couldn't, it just didn't work this time. But it was great. Like if you can get to Italy, you're gonna love it and you're not gonna spend too much money. If you rent B&Bs, you can eat a great meal for ten dollars. You can buy a glass of wine for two fifty. Buy a bottle of wine for four or five dollars. It's, it's, it's just crazy. It really is. So it just was a great, great time all around. Europe and diet never works. <laughs> so I guess that's so true. Okay, so let's go. So let's talk about now. Let's see. Hopefully, I have, hopefully I have. Oh no, did I, did I lose this one too? Let's see. Let's see. Am I losing all my, all my slides? My diet and workout, we did that. We did the wedding, new scenic diet work. Okay, so this is my reset. Okay, this is what I've been doing since I've been back. And I do a very similar thing to this. Like I, we used to, you know, go to the Hamptons a couple of weeks every summer, you know, with the pandemic and this and that, maybe we only do one week now. I, I there were times when we used to go three weeks in the Hamptons with my brother, my parents, and we, I used to love it. So we would like overeat, overdo it. And then as soon as I got back, I would always go into like a routine like this. So this is what I've been doing since I was back. I must have been maybe five pounds over, maybe three pounds of that was water weight from overeating and drinking all the wine for the two weeks. So I got back, I said, you know what, I'm just gonna jump right into it. I decided to do the OMAD diet for two days, like ate one meal a day. And I'll show you at the end, I don't think I'm gonna even have my meals here because I, I lost the picture, but let me, let me show you a picture of the meal of what I was talking about. Let's see, wedding, new scene. Let me see, I'll pull in a picture for you of maybe like like what I mean by what I ate when I did the old when I would did the one meal a day. Let's see the downloads. And sorry guys, I'm normally in, normally these pictures are all here. I even did a video on it. I pretty much just ate eggs and bacon like this. Like this was like I, I went really light on calories, maybe on an old mad day. I just had something like this. You know, high protein. I gave myself a little bit of a treat of some bacon. So I just had, you know, four pasture aids eggs half an avocado, maybe that may be even be a whole avocado, just a couple of slices of orange, a little bit of bacon. You know, this is like a low five, 600 calories. That's all I ate. And I did that for like two days in a row. Cause it is really interesting. I really started, it's amazing how quickly things change. I can imagine if you've been like, you know, in, in a bad spot for like years, uh, like insulin resistant, type two diabetes, all that type of stuff. Within just these 12, 13 days of eating the, that bread and the pasta and the pizza, I just started craving it. It's amazing. So I just like, let, let me just nip this right in the bud. So I did two OMAD days right out of the bat the first two days I got back. And I feel I already, I, I shedded a whole bunch of water weight. It lost like three pounds, almost four pounds in those first two days. And then I did something a little bit less aggressive. The third day I did a 20 hour fast. I think I did a video on it, released it on Instagram too, where I fasted for 20 hours and I did my typical thing. I just ate two meals within um, a four hour eating window. Cause you know, I'm always conscious about protein. That's another thing on, on the trip to Italy. I definitely did not eat anywhere near 150 grams of protein, not even close. You know, I must've been like maybe 50 grams. I didn't get to, I had that chicken one time, you know, there was those cold cuts, you're getting some protein there, but not too much. So I was nowhere near at an adequate amount of protein. That also based on that, you know, protein leverage hypothesis, I always talk about that. You, you can always be hungry until you reach your protein requirement for the day. So I just, I have to say, from eating the carbs, eating low protein, I was hungry in Italy all the time, which is really, really interesting, you know? Okay, this is Chris. When I was diabetic, I craved cookies and I went ice cream all the time. Now with my new lifestyle, new lifestyle, I don't crave them at all. I crave protein now. That's great, Chris. I'm so happy for you, but I totally relate to that. Chris has totally turned this whole life around, lost 65 pounds, was type two diabetic, insulin resistant, all that type of stuff. He's totally turned around, he's doing so incredibly well. And it's so true, but it's amazing how quickly things can turn the wrong way. Just from like two weeks of me, of me like eating pizza and pasta and stuff every single day, not eating enough protein, I started just getting really hungry, which you know, it reminded me of like when I was younger, in my 20s, I always talk about this, in my 20s and 30s, 
I followed more of a traditional bodybuilding diet that was popular back then, which you you'll always get kept your protein up. But I would eat like high carb, low fat. And even though I looked good and my body fat levels were relatively low, I was hungry all the time. And my blood work is much better now. Now I eat, as you know, I eat more of a high protein, moderate carb, moderate to low carb, um, you know, type diet. And I do take in a, a good amount of calories from fat, but I don't chase fat. The fat comes from the whole natural foods I'm eating, you know. So like I'm eating avocados and like you say, salmon and sardines and whole eggs and things like that. So I do get a good amount of calories from fat, but I don't really add fat you know, to my diet necessarily. A little EVOO when I'm sorting vegetables and on my salads and when I'm cooking. But I don't put like butter in my coffee and I don't put mayonnaise and I, I, don't, I don't add fats to my diet even though most of my calories probably do come from fat. And now since I've been, so I did two days of, of the OMAD aggressive, like low calories, maybe under 800 calories. The 20 hour fast with um, two meals, four hour eating window. I probably was at around a couple thousand calories, maybe in a little, even a little bit less. And already after three days, I started feeling like pretty much like I'm getting back on track. This is Chris. Okay. I highly su- suggest anyone needing help to, to dial in nutrition to hire Mike at he is on point professional. I really appreciate it, Chris. Thanks so much. That's great. And then um, day four. I just I, I upped it a little bit more because I now because I'm hitting the gym doing the resistance training. We're going to talk about that too. Uh, you know, I did it like yesterday. I did a typical 16-8 faster for 16 hours. I did do a pre-workout protein shake. I posted a video on it um, in my stories on Instagram where I was missing my l citrulline Like my pre-workout or intra-workout drink is generally I do you know I do water and then I do one scoop of of a whey protein isolate. I like Garden of Life, you know, 120 calories, 24 grams of protein. Plus, it's high in those branch chain amino acids, high in leucine. That's the most important amino acid for putting on and maintaining muscle. Has 2,800 milligrams of leucine, which is a nice amount of leucine. You want around that 2,500, 3,000 milligrams of leucine. Then I put a scoop of beetroot powder because beetroot powder. I've talked about this before too. It's naturally high in nitrates. Which, can, which helps the body make nitric oxide, which is great for blood flow. Really gives you a nice pump in the gym. And I typically also would put six grams of L-citrulline. L-citrulline is a non-essential amino acid, but helps the body make arginine, which in turn, arginine helps the body make nitric oxide. So I use a different mechanism, which gives you like a great pump in the gym. I just ran out of it. I have to order some more from Amazon. And that's like kind of like my pre-workout. I, right, and I also put half a scoop of collagen protein powder because good, good good for connective tissue good for joints so I must have got maybe 30 35 grams of protein there and then th- then I did my normal two meals you know upping the calories a little bit more so I was probably a little on the maintenance yesterday maybe I ate 22 2300 calories maybe maybe um, yesterday something like that and today I'm doing what I typically do I'm gonna do my own mad day you know since I do my live stream I prepared these slides earlier after this I go take my you know 90 minute to two hour fasted walk I'll do one nice big meal today, and then Monday, back and running. Another thing I should have put in the slides, which I didn't, I've also been working on my, obviously working on my circadian rhythm because of the sleep difference. So every morning, like, like I'm, I ease back into my workouts, but every morning I didn't miss since I've been back, I actually go right outside and, uh, and take a walk. But I have to say with, I don't know if you heard, I, you probably have heard in New York, the smoke from those, like those Canadian, I think it's those, those Canadian fires were insane. I probably shouldn't have done it because it really wasn't even sunny, but I said I have to. So even with the smoke, I still did it, you know, with the smoke and, and, and maybe it wasn't a good idea, but I don't have asthma or anything like that. I walked outside 45 minutes in the morning and then I did another walk 45 minutes in the evening. And this is something that I made even a note of it, um, micro progression. This is a mistake that I used to make for decades, in my 20s, 30s, even 40s, that, you know, I always felt so bad, you know, whenever I went away, like, oh, I'm gonna get out of shape. I would go to the gym, I'd hit it so hard. And then I'd like hurt myself or like mess something up. So I really, really, when, whenever I go on vacation, I really micro progress back into shape. And I find progression to be probably one of the most difficult things for most people to truly understand when it comes to fitness, especially me. I've always had a hard time with progression. People, you really, I mean, you really have to make slow incremental improvements. Like even though, like for example, say I get on the Stairmaster and I normally would do like level seven for 30 minutes, that would be my hard interval with all these intervals in it. I literally did like level four first day. I did one hit routine. I did like level four instead of my typical level seven. 
instead of doing like say instead of bench pressing 50 pound dumbbells i was using 35s and i'm just going to ease my way back i'm going to take my time with it i probably won't be back even next week i'll probably take it easy the week after that i'll probably right be uh, i'll probably be right back strength wise and all that to where i was so what i was doing now is doing those 45 minute walks in the morning the evening half of the reason for doing that is just to re- reset my circadian rhythm now that the smoke and fog is gone, it's great. It's really good. Then I was doing my light resistance training workouts midday in the afternoon. And I wanted to do the pre-workout shakes just to give me a little bit more energy. So I think I trained upper body twice. I did one um, I did one lower body exercise. And I, I'm already feeling back. I think by Monday, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be really, I'm going to be pretty much back already. And then I'll be back to my normal strength routine one week after that with a few more workouts. Yeah. It is better to do a workout that's far from perfect than the perfect workout you'd never, never. No, I totally agree. I totally agree with that. Like I always say, like um, a short workout is better than no workout, right? Whenever in doubt, work out. You know, those are like a couple of sayings I would always tell my clients, meaning that there's so many times, oh, should I work out? I don't know. Should I? I mean, there's no such thing as a bad workout. I mean, you know, you just, as long as you don't hurt yourself, right? You know, whenever in doubt, just work, just go work out. And to me, just take a walk if you're not in the mood. You know, you know, just get out, just start moving around, which is key. Hey, Blue Sky. Hey, Mike. Welcome back. I have been doing 16-8 fasting for a while. I break my fast in the, in, in the noon time, but I heard that it's not good for building muscle for older men. Is that true? See, that, that uh, it's interesting because I've talked about this a lot in different live streams. I did some videos on it. There definitely is some research saying that taking in protein earlier in the day like doing more of an early time restricted eating is probably better for maintaining muscle mass especially when you get older and how i came across a lot of this research is following that guy andrew huberman i talk about him all the time i love his podcast it's called huberman within a huberman labs he's a professor from stanford and he adjusted his fasting schedule and he pulled up these studies and i looked at the studies and probably that's what we talked about i've talked about this many times sometimes a little hack you might want to do if 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 that noon first of all i think it's you're still going to get a ton of benefit in doing a typical like 16 8 noon to 8 p.m no question about it you're going to keep calories under control as long as you're eating enough protein and you're eating good food quality you're still going to get a tremendous amount of benefit and you're going to be leaps and bounds better than most most people but if you really want to up it a notch and, it can, and if it can fit into your schedule if you could have a meal more from like t- instead of 12 to 8 do something 10 to 6 it probably would be better but a hack that we've talked about before here is that if you maybe you want to do an essential amino acid supplement you're like a powder where you're just taking the amino acids so you're getting some of that protein earlier in the day it's almost next to no calories it's a little confusing because you know look at the bottle it says no calories 90 percent of the time because supplement companies don't have to list calories because it's not a complete food. It's like individual amino acids. So maybe for like 15, 20 calories, you can get the equivalent of say like a scoop of whey protein, which would be 120 calories, 25 grams of protein, if that noon to eight schedule really fits into your lifestyle. That's the main thing. And you know, once again, these are only a couple of studies. Probably if you're taking in enough protein from 12 to eight, I think you're really still gonna be okay. But if you wanna up it a notch, that's kind of what the new research is is indicating or that and they use the term early time restricted eating let's see okay is a 30 minute walk every day enough thanks no i think a 30 minute walk compared to is is excellent i mean if you can do more i would love you to do more see i think you know first of all it depends like what what's your goal of walking if you're walking just at a comfortable like pace like maybe three three and a half miles an hour and you're building your aerobic base 30 minutes is nice. If you're walking 30 minutes and you're getting some hills in and you're doing like a little bit of intervals, 30 minutes I think is definitely enough. But I think that if you can do like multiple walks, maybe even like two 20 minute walks, like in the morning, in the evening or or something like that, I think it would even be better. But you do reach a point in diminishing returns when it comes to like increasing say your aerobic ability, like a VO2 max. But that's if you're doing something really, really intense you, you know, more is always better to a point of diminishing return. So it's kind of hard to say, you know, if you let me know exactly what your goals are, I'll, I'll give you maybe a better answer. Okay. 
Okay, I also read this on Science Daily, skipping breakfast associated with hardening of the arteries. Yeah, that, you know, I haven't read that, but I know there's definitely, it probably does make more sense if you can take in calories earlier in the day. A lot of it is also due to your circadian rhythm. Doctor, you know, that circadian code, Dr. Pan, I talk about that all the time, great book. He, he doesn't want you eating as soon as you wake up. He wants you to wait at least 90 minutes. But he, he does recommend for your circadian rhythm to like eat early, like eat before 10 o'clock if you can. Because the time and day in which you wake up and go to sleep, the time of days in which you, I mean the time of day in which you eat does affect your circadian rhythm, that 24 hour internal clock. So if you can wake up, go to sleep the same time every day, get sunlight first thing in the morning, the more sunlight you get during the day, the better you're gonna sleep at night. Eat your meals the same time during the day, have a little bit of something. Um, even, who, who's that other guy, David Sinclair, he's the other longevity guy from um, from Harvard. He likes, the, he only eats one meal a day, but he does have a little bit of yoga with his supplements um, around 10 o'clock in the morning. I've heard him say that, I think, due to circadian rhythm and some other reasons too, even though he's only eating one meal a day. So if you could take in a little bit of protein, some food earlier in the day, probably is a good idea if you can. I, I may say, I've done that and then I, I have a harder time with it, but a lot of times I do that essential amino acid. And sometimes too, I'm not, I'm getting a little bit more lenient with this, these fasting schedules. Like sometimes maybe at 10 o'clock, maybe I'll have a Quest protein bar, like 170 calories, 21 grams of protein, four neck carbs. Yes, it's breaking my fast, but I'm not necessarily fasting for autophagy. You know, autophagy is like the cell cleansing which is supposedly good for longevity. I mean, I don't mind just a, like 170 calories. Yes, I broke my fast, but maybe it's a good thing and then I'm only doing too mad, you know? So sometimes I do that. I, you know, my biggest belief when it came to fasting is that it's just an incredible way to keep calories under control. No question about it. Like if you're only eating two meals a day within like an eight hour, six hour eating window, it's hard to mess up unless you're just binge eating and gorging yourself. So. Besides the other health health benefits of keeping insulin levels low and all that, I don't think it's all that bad even to have maybe like two hard boiled eggs at 10 o'clock, get 15 grams of protein, jump starts your circadian rhythm, get your get your metabolism going a little bit. Yes, you're gonna break your fast. What 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 are two eggs? What's it like 50, 60 calories? You get it taking a hundred calories. You know, I it may do more benefit than harm, unless you're really fasting straight up for autophagy or something like that. It, it will mess that up because you're, you know, between the mTOR and the AMPK, you know, it kind of messes that up a little bit. Thank you, sure. Mike, uh, okay, Mike. Um, Mike, how, prote how protein do you recommend to build muscle while also reducing visceral fat? I'm, so, I'm sure you mean to say how much protein do you recommend to build muscle while also reducing visceral fat? And people don't know visceral fat is unfortunately probably the worst type of fat in your body. It's that deep fat around your organs. You generally see it on guys and guys with really, really big midsections that kind of like that hot fat that doesn't jiggle. Unfortunately, it's associated with like metabolic syndrome, like insulin resistance, high blood pressure, or, you know, type two diabetes, all, all the real, um, all the real bad spot. I, I you know, I, there's a couple of different formulas. The, the best formula probably used, but you'd have to know what your percent body fat is, is just to take your lean mass. You know, let's say you're 150 pounds, your 20% body fat, so that would be like 120 pounds, multiply that by 0.9. That would probably be the best. But another good formula is you can just go zero, I mean 0 0.7 and multiply that by your weight and eat that many grams of protein. The, 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 these equations get a little crazy like that if you have a ton of weight to lose. Like say you're 300 pounds, but you wanna weigh 200 is like your goal weight, your ideal weight. I wouldn't multiply 0 0.7 by, by 300. It'd just probably be too much protein. I probably would use your goal weight. But make sure you eat enough protein. And there are online calculators that you can use too. But let's say if you're if you're 200 pounds and you wanna weigh like 175, I would want you to eat at least 150 grams of protein. If you're 250 and you wanna weigh 200, maybe 175 grams of protein. Every four ounces of chicken, fish, and meat is about 25 grams. So let's say you have a 10 ounce. I try to eat about 65 grams of protein in each of my two meals. So like I'll have 10 ounces of chicken, fish, meat, something like that. If I, if I only have like eight ounces, and I do talk about this a lot on Instagram with different videos and pictures, which is maybe 50, which is only um, eight ounces, it'll be 50 grams. I'll add a Greek yogurt, which is like 100 calories, 15 more grams of protein. 
you know, don't cut back on protein, even though you're reducing calories. And the visceral fat is just a separate thing. You know, you just have to restrict calories. I probably, there is a, there is a little bit of science saying that intermittent fasting, time restricted eating is good for reducing visceral fat, just keeping insulin levels low, controlling blood sugar. And then just, you know, being in a calorie deficit is gonna help you with the visceral fat. And like I say, my general formula for, for calorie deficit, multiply your body weight by 10 or 11. So you're 200 pounds, you know, eat 21, 2000 calories a day, eat 150 grams of protein, you know, also keep the fiber up, you're gonna do incredibly well. And if you can do that with two meals and maybe just a little bit of a protein bar protein shake, that's my formula. You know who had me on? I, I've been Chris knows this guy. You know who just had me on his um in his group yesterday? I think I'm gonna start doing something with him. Like, you know, Clark, um, you know, he, he he was great and I, I gave everyone in the group there my my um my weightless calorie formula. Everyone seemed to like it, so I'm really excited about that. Let me see. That's what we got here. Okay, this is Ellen. Hi, Mike. I'm on OMAD and walk 30 minutes daily. Okay, that's great. You mentioned two walks a day. I have to talk myself into once a day. I said, I, I, truthfully, if you're doing OMAD, you're probably in a really good calorie restricted state, only eating one meal a day. One 30 minute walk when it comes to that, I think is probably ideal. I'm assuming you're doing it at a comfortable pace. I'm really happy with that. Do it. Stay with it. I mean, be proud of yourself for doing it. I think it's a great thing. Don't don't overdo it. One thirty minute walk a day. You're probably in the top 20, 15, 20 percent of the country. No one's walking anywhere, you know. So I think you're doing great. Hey Chris. Oh Chris. Hey, thanks so much, Chris. Chris is always giving me super chats. He gives me super chats. He donates on my Facebook when I do posts. Giving me. He's always throwing money at me. I really appreciate it, Chris. You know, it really helps. It helps me keep the channel going and all that. So I really appreciate it. Okay. So um, from Chris, Chris Davis. Um, I'm having a question about my pre-workout. How come you drink it before the workout versus after? I'm still learning. I'm hooked on the L-citrulline, which is great, and the amino powder. What brand do you use for beetroot powder? Okay, when it comes to, um, okay, even though I say pre-workout, I do a combination. I use it as a pre-workout and an intra-workout drink. And why I probably do it as opposed to doing it afterwards, See, doing it afterwards, I also think is great because there is, you know, there's been so much debate and so much talk about it. Like years ago, we lived and died by that anabolic window, meaning that you wanted to take in protein, like in, and some carbs, and even creatine, like within 45 minutes after a workout. They think you absorb it better. The body's prime for it because you're like, you know, you're the insulin is going to spike it up and like kind of store it in the muscles, help with protein synthesis. There probably is a little bit of truth to that. I love this one book. Um, Nutrient Timing by John Ivey. I lived and died by that book. I actually love the book. There's a little bit something to that, but it seems like the new research is saying that it's more important just making sure you're taking an adequate amount of protein throughout the day or like within every 24 hour period or so, you know, for the protein synthesis. So it's not as important as people believed. Why I like to have it before the workout. First of all, I, you know, a lot of times I'm doing my aerobics faster, but when it comes to my resistance training, I'm pretty much have been fasting all night. Maybe I've been, I've been fasting 16, 18 hours. I just want a little bit more energy to get a good hard resistance training workout in. Plus, I like the idea of increasing nitric oxide, like from that L-citrulline and from the beetroot powder to give me a better pump in the gym for good for blood flow, good for circulation. And I like, sit, I like to drink half of it, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes before the workout. And then I like to drink the other half while I'm working out. I just feel it helps. I don't know if it's psychological. They did talk, John Ivey did talk about that in that book years ago. Nutrient timing, that in, like taking in five to 10 grams of protein intra workout with a little bit of carbohydrate is a great thing. I, I, I'm just, I like it. I feel like I definitely can work out harder and better. And when it comes to resistance training, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of working at a pretty good intensity, like 85, 90% effort sometimes. I barely go to failure, but I'm working pretty hard. When it comes to aerobics, like I wouldn't do this before my walk in the morning or in the evening. I wouldn't do this even before probably a HIIT workout routine. Um, but maybe on a HIIT, but probably not. But I do do it most of the time when it comes to resistance training. But also, Chris, totally okay to do it post-workout. I mean, if you don't need the energy of the drink, to fuel your workout, if you feel like on the days when you're doing your, that circuit or you're going to, I don't think you said you're going to Anytime Fitness and you're, when you're doing your resistance training, you can do it post-workout. If you're taking creatine, 
there seems to be some some recent, recent research saying that it's probably better to take the creatine post workout. Okay, now when it comes to to the brand of beetroot powder, I've tried so many different lately. I've just been buying the Whole Foods brand because I've been at Whole Foods every single day. It's like fourteen dollars for like thirty servings. I do one um, heaping tablespoon. The research has shown when it comes to like it's, the research is more on beet juice. The reason why I don't go with beet juice is because I don't want the calories. You can get the same amount of nitrates. They say if you're drinking like 16 ounces of beet juice, you can get about four or 500 milligrams of nitrates. And that's if you're 150 pounds, there was one famous study done, not famous, but like a study that everyone looks at that looks at beet, beet juice powder, I mean, no, beet juice, I'm sorry, beet juice, saying that if you're 150 pounds, you need about 400 milligrams of nitrate, to, and then that converts to nitric oxide it, and it increases exercise performance. It totally worked. I did that many, many times. I just don't want the 180, 200 calories from that 16 ounces of beet juice, but I experimented with it. I was doing it about four or five years ago where I would do this brutally hard hit, high intensity interval workout on, a, um, on an elliptical at my gym. Even though it bothered my knee, I just, I just was doing it anyway. And I had this whole protocol. Like, for example, I would see how much ground I could cover within 30 minutes. And I used the same protocol, meaning that, say I would start at level 6 at a 10% incline. And I would keep the cadence the same. And then I would go, I would go level 6, I would do like a really hard interval, level 10, for one minute, then come back down. But I followed the same protocol. And when I would take the beet juice like that 16 ounces of beet juice, which is a lot of beet juice, like you pee, you pee red, not beet red, but you pee red. I mean, it's, it's that much beet juice. The, the next day, it's like really kind of kind of creepy. I got scared the first time I did it. Like for example, if I was typically cover say 3.5 miles without the beet juice within 30 minutes, I was able to get to like 3.9, I even hit four mile. I mean, I was like 15% stronger with the beet juice. So there's no question about it. It work. It works. And then there was a company it's called Beet Elite who came out with this beetroot powder and they claim to do the same thing. But then I read I read this other research study that looked at some of the beet juices and looked at some of the beet powders and this study said now nah, that beet elite has doesn't have enough nitrates in it. The confusing thing is about beets because I, I was almost going to start a supplement company. I even had backers. I raised actually 100. I had a, someone was going to give me 100,000. I had another guy who wanted to give me the same, and the whole thing fell apart. But the, see, beets have anywhere between 1% to 3% nitrates in a beet. So, and it's very, when you look at beetroot powder, even the one that I take, the one at, at Whole Foods, it isn't standardized, meaning that it's really hard for me to say how many nitrates are in that beet powder. When it came to the juice, they were saying that Lockwood brand was a good brand of juice, but I, Chris, I don't think you should be drinking the beet juice. You don't want that many calories and all the sugar. The beetroot powder though, what just for me looking at different studies and just being online or whatever, I find like one, one heaping tablespoon, you're gonna do two, two tablespoons, only be like 25, 30 calories, has about four or 500 milligrams of nitrates. There's a couple, there's one supplement I think it's called Oxy, um, let me think, let me think of it. I'll get back to you on it. I think it's called Oxy 7 that has like, the, that standardizes it. It's, it's like a trademark supplement. I was going to put that in, in, in the supplement company when I started. I was going to use that. Other things like I talk about all the time too is arugula. Arugula is incredible for nitrates. Like 100 grams of arugula has about 500 milligrams of nitrates. But you can't eat an arugula salad before a workout. It's kind of hard to digest. But I do that a lot almost every single day. So I want to keep my nitric oxide up for sure. And they say, you know, like we talked about in the past, L-citrulline is really high in watermelon, but in the rind of the watermelon, but you have to eat a lot of it. You know, um, I would experiment with it, Chris, and see, and see, you know, what works best with you. But there's definitely something to it, you know, for sure. Increasing nitrates, especially the older you get, increasing nit the nitrates, nitric oxide. Yes, meat, how much, yes, um, I mean, yes, how much protein, right? So yeah, I think we talked about that, right? You know, either, either you can multiply your body weight by 0 0.7, or if you have a lot of weight to use, you can multiply your goal weight by 0 0.7. Okay, here's James. Hello, Mike. Hello, hello, Mike. Good to see you back from Motherland. <laughs> that sounds good. I was wondering, I was wondering when you would, when would be the best time to take fish oil pill in the morning on an empty stomach or after meal, 
and do you need it every day? Okay, I would say I would probably take it with food. But this interesting thing about fish oil, I used to take a ton of fish oil. I still do from time to time. Like since I eat so much fish, like I eat so I eat sardines and salmon. If I don't eat salmon one day, I'm eating sardines the next, and I'll even smoke salmon. I eat so much oily fish that I, I generally stop taking the fish oil pills. You know, like for example, maybe if I just have a weird week where I'm just not eating any fish, I may take it. And then one of the reasons why I stopped, and and it's is and this is from Peter T. I, another guy like Andrew, I talk about Peter T. all the time. He's he's a um, the, the probably the probably the most well renowned longevity doctor. Another Harvard guy has a great podcast called The Drive, and there is some research, and it's pretty pretty it's real. And he talked about it in a podcast and on his um, website that it's it's a patient by patient basis whether he would let his patients take fish oil pill because there is a correlation between taking fish oil and AFib, meaning irregular heart rate, especially when you get older, which is kind of weird. It's bizarre. It doesn't seem so when you're eating fish and you're getting the omega threes from the fish, but when you take a fish oil supplement. This seems to be a correlation, it's, and it seems to be real because there's been more than one study talking about it, saying it, it could possibly, you know, lead to artificial, you know, um, irregular heart rate, like an AFib type heart rate. Have, obviously, you have to be predisposed to AFib, but I've also heard Ryan the Kaufman talk about that. She's another one. Um, what's the name of her podcast? She's another like PhD who's known in in the science world for like health or fitness and talking about this stuff. I think it's something, f f I forget the name of her podcast. Um, it'll come to me, but she interviewed, I saw it was like a three hour podcast of this cardiologist who was known for recommending fish oil and she outright asked him and he said, no, yeah, it, it is true. We need some more research on that. That's the one downside. But the general gist is in general, even with Peter Atia, even with Ryan the Kaufman, that there are so many benefits, the increasing omega-3s for brain health, for inflammation, for all these different things. Um, for lowering cholesterol and other bad cholesterol that it probably is a good thing to take but I've taken the approach and I did the same thing you were doing James I was taking a ton I was doing those Carlson's and, and, and you know I was doing like tablespoons of fish oil I just make sure I eat a lot of um, omega I, I just eat a lot of omega-3 type foods I do those salmon roll fish eggs I eat salmon almost every day. You know, I, I have sardines almost every day. I try to minimize the mercury by like, you know, you know low on the train. Um, I haven't heard anything about the krill oil. You know, I, you know maybe, I, I don't know. You know, I, but I just keep that in mind. If you want to Google it, maybe I'll do a video on it. If you want to Google it, um, fish oil and AFib and see what comes up. You'll see a couple of studies like pop right up. Or you can even put fish oil, Peter Atia or fish oil, Andrew Huberman, fish oil, um, Ron the Kaufman, and see what pops up. Well, actually, you know what I've been, I gotta say, I, I, I talked about this a couple times in the past. I don't know if you, if everyone's been using this chat GDP, it is just mind blowing to me how incredible it is. That's something you, you would ask chat GDP, pull up the most recent studies on fish oil and, and AFib, and it's just gonna, it's just gonna print out the whole answer for you as opposed to Googling it, Googling it, it's just incredible. Okay, okay. I'm 200 pounds and want to weigh 175. Thanks, Mike. Okay, let's do it for you right now. So if you're 200 pounds, at 200 pounds, I probably, I probably was 70, I probably, let's go at 175. Let's take 175 and multiply that by 0. 0.7. That's 122.5 grams of protein a day. Eat 125 grams of protein per day. That's what I would do. And eat around 2,000 calories, right? A day and you're just gonna kill it I mean if you want to cycle your calories a little bit you could do 2001 day 10 times your body weight the next like 2001 day 1750 the next day always eat 125 grams of protein so if you have to, if you had two like um, 10 ounce servings of animal protein a day you'll be great or an 8 ounce serving with um, two 8 ounce servings with a protein shake you'll be fine too but that sounds that sounds good to me thanks no problem yeah, Clark. Yeah, Clark. Bar yes, Clark Bartram had me on his um group um, his group. What's we call it? His group um. What do you call this? Oh my God, what's wrong with my brain today? Maybe all this, all this wine and all these carbohydrates are giving me brain fog. On a Zoom call, yeah, he had one in one of his Zoom groups. I want to. I would. I like to get something going with him. He, I think he's gonna help me. 
you know, build, you know, um, build my online business, which would be incredible. I really like him too. He's such a nice guy, great personality. I've been following him for years. You know, we're like the same age. You know, I think he's a good guy. So I'm really excited about that. Let's see. Um, I'm glad I connected you with Clark. Oh, yeah, and I really appreciate it, Chris. It's great. It's great. He even chatted me out a couple of times. When I was in Italy, and I think you were on that stream too, but I was in Lake Como walking in the street with my wife. He, uh, he told everyone, oh, you know, Mike calls again. You know, I like his content. He's, he, he knows his stuff. Um, follow him. So that was really nice. So then when I got back, I contacted him, you know, which, which was great. And he got right back to me too, which was really, really nice of him. Oh, sure. No, I appreciate it. Oh, that's great. Okay, let's, let's see Jeff. Let's see what Jeff's doing. Okay, this is Jeff. I'm doing 5-2. So, for example, he's eating normally for five days. Two days out of the week, he's, he's doing fasting days. With Sunday and Thursday as my fast days, which is nice. Tennis. Tuesday and Thursday at night, okay? So I'm so I just have the amino acid powder after tennis and do my highest cal days Wednesday and Friday focus on enough protein. I, I think that's great, Jeff. I love it. I think that's really good. As long as you got good energy for your tennis and all that, I think you're killing it. That sounds good to me. Okay. Oh, and I walk right after eating lunch. Not 30 minutes more. Than, that's, that's still fine. It's good to do. That's what I mean. I mean, I, I know the other guy I was doing OMAD. That's, I mean, even there is really good research out there saying how just taking like a 10 minute walk, walk after, after meals is so good for controlling blood sugar. There's even one study that I looked at talking about it. it works almost as good as taking like a diabetic type medication like metformin. It really does help control blood sugar, which is incredible. That's one thing I, I, I really missed in Italy too. You know, when I went to Rome, after every meal, after every pasta meal, we were walking like crazy. This trip, it was kind of hard. But if you can just do like a 10-minute walk or just stay busy around the house. Like the, what you don't want to do is eat dinner, especially late. Like you want at least three hours or so, two, three hours before you go to, you go to bed not to eat. But even if you have dinner, say, 7 o'clock, clean the house up for 10 minutes, vacuum. That's why it's interesting. I, I even think there's a correlation with, you know, back like in the 50s and 60s. I remember my parents, too, when I was a kid, be all... You do the dishes, you know, you stand up and you do the dishes together after you have dinner. Even that, there's something to that. What you don't want to do after a meal, especially dinner, is sit on the couch and like watch TV and not move around and then go to sleep with, you know, with food in your stomach. That's like the worst possible thing to do. You got to move around after you eat. So if you can just do even the 15 minutes, I think it's great, Jeff, but you want to move around a little bit after meals. No question about it. It's going to like really, really help with our blood sugar. Let's see, Chris. Uh, thanks for answering uh, me. I will. I will try drinking my protein and pre and during my workout. Should I add a multi? I, I don't think you have to do the multi dextrose to my shake or digestive enzymes. Thanks, but you know, I don't think you need the. I don't think you need the sugar like that. If, I mean, if you think if it's the calories are under control and it's not too high, and you really think there's a benefit, I, I wouldn't. I mean, the beetroot. If you're putting the beetroot powder, you're getting little carbs there, a little sugar there to some degree. If you want to put a digestive enzyme, if you feel like it helps you, you could. Um, even just taking a little papaya pills, a couple of something like that, I mean, could could possibly help. I wouldn't be that concerned unless you got something going on, Chris, with with your digestion. I mean, especially if you're doing like that whey protein isolate. I think that you're doing the one that I like, Garden of Life. They got those uh, probiotics in there. They give you so much good stuff. It's so digestible. If you were doing like a concentrate or like a, a low quality protein powder that may be upsetting you a little bit or this that with with that garden of life whey protein isolate i i don't think you have any issue with it plus they, like i said they give you the probiotics in there too which is kind of nice mm. i okay this is retired. i exercise in a faster state including lifting weights i mean i think that's okay as long as you feel you're getting a good workout in if you feel you have good energy you can work out faster i did it for years on and off Sometimes I still do it today, when, but for me personally, when it comes to my resistance training, I just feel like I get a better workout when I have like a pre-workout um, drink or intra-workout drink. But you don't have to. There's plenty of times when I didn't. You know, I know like Thomas Delore. You know, he's he's got that monster following on on YouTube, maybe three million um, followers, and he's a smart guy. He's into the science, and he does a lot most of his workouts in a fasted state. You know, so and he look at him. The guy looks like a you know. Like a professional bodybuilder, right? It looks incredible. Let's see. Hand pink waving. I'm not sure what, what I'm not sure what you mean by that. 
Bono hand pink waving. Oh, you wait. Oh, you say it's something in Italian. Oh, that's interesting. Blue. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what you mean. Thank you. I look into you know look into it. You know, I don't want to scare you, throw you off. I mean, I did it for decades, taking fish oil. You know, but I, but I I started being a little more careful with it, ever since hearing Peter T and those, and those guys and gals and around the Calvin like talk about it, like that. Okay, sardines or salmon once a week has you covered. Yeah, you know, see, yeah, you know, true. I mean, I, I do a lot more though, but yeah. Here's Jeff. Is that heartbeat thing true for calamari oil too? Um, I'm not sure with calamari oil. That's what I have been taking for a while. I'm not really sure. I know they're talking about straight up fish oil, and most of the fish oil comes from, you know, comes from like mackerel and sardines, and and um, the the brands that I used to buy all was Carlson's and Nordic Naturals. Those, those are the two most popular brands that most people like. But other people just take tons of the fish oil, have no issues. I know a lot of other people I follow just love it. And I even even though um, Ryan the Kaufman, you know, brought that point up with the with the with the doctor, I think she still takes it because she has I think she has that genotype for um, APO, which she's like predisposed to Alzheimer's disease. So she wants as many omega threes as possible, like running through her system. And and I get tons of I think, but I but I do think, like I said before, James and everyone, I think you can get and and like what um. The uh, V is pointing out is that you really can get enough omega threes within your diet for sure. But we, like I said, you do want to avoid, especially, you know, you want that ratio to be really good. Like you want to minimize the omega sixes, the sixes. Like you need some because some are essential, but you don't need too many. If you have an olive oil, you're probably getting enough from your olive oil. You want to minimize those seed oils, you know, for sure. Those processed oils, which are like rancid before you even eat them, you know, that's the main thing. Okay, eating sardines three times a week. Love them. But love, love, hate them, but eat them anyway. Yeah, and I understand what you're saying too. I really, truly do love them. At first, I was, I was like, oh, I don't know, but now I absolutely love them. I really do. I had them in Italy too a couple of times, which was great. Okay, if I eat three to four cans of sardines a week, do you think that would be enough? Yeah, I, 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 I think you'd be really close. Um, I would probably like three. I, I would. I, I used to know. It used to be in my head exactly how many milligrams. Of omega threes were in the can. I'll have to look it up again. But I think if you're doing it three to four times a week, I think that would be pretty good. I mean, do you eat any salmon at all too, or any other oily fish? Like if you had salmon once a week and maybe three cans of sardines, I think I think you'd be good to go right there. And plus two, I mean, you're getting omega threes also from those pasture raised eggs, right? If you're buying, I know it costs more money, but if you even you're buying grass fed, grass finished type, you know, beef and you know, and meat proteins, you're getting some omega threes there because it's coming from a good, you know, the fat profile is is, is higher in omega threes if they're grass finished, grass fed. Even things like um, what, like flaxseed and walnuts and like things like that, also have some omega threes. So you're probably getting some omega threes from other parts of your diet as well. And like I said, you can also try those those salmon raw fish eggs, things like that. Um, mackerel you know too you can even buy salmon like salmon like the tuna fish salmon um, like that the smoked salmon i love too even though some people don't like smoked foods but I, I i love it i i eat it i eat the smoked salmon all the time as well okay chris okay this is chris now okay i need help building i need help building channel if i paid you mike would you be willing to help me meant to me. I'm not sure what you mean by building a channel. Are you talking about, um, I mean, you want to start a YouTube channel? You, I, Chris, I think you would be incredible at that, especially if you had all those, you're a natural, you know, like, but I think you know what you're doing. You got to probably get like a, a ton of incredible before and after pictures, just documenting, you know, I, w I would, you know, I'm sure you follow the guy, Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, he, you know, he's like the, the premier guy when it comes to like social media and stuff. He would just say like document your life. If you can just, it would be such a natural for you to just to document your life and you can do the whole thing with your cell phone. I, I initially, I went too deep. You know, my YouTube channel is not even really, really that successful, but I think I would be more successful do, if I was someone like yourself. I think you're a natural for it. You lost 65 pounds, you reverse type two diabetes. I mean, you can, I, you can kill it. You know, you can do incredibly well. You know who I like? There's a couple of guys I like. I'm in a number of different YouTube groups. I like, um. Daniel Bata Daniel Bat uh, Batal, I like his group a lot. 
he's, he's really, you know, you know, Daryl Eves, he's, he's probably the king. He's probably the head guy. But um, Tom, who's the other guy? Tom, um, video creators. I forget. I think it's Tom's last name. I'll send you a whole bunch of different people that I follow and groups that I'm, and that I'm in creators. But I can help you for sure if you want me to. You know, but, you know, I, I, I think when it comes to like a successful YouTube channel, so much of it is just like an art as opposed to a science. There are certain things you may want to do when it comes to like titles and thumbnails. But the main thing is to think of who you're trying to reach, like who your audience is, and then make videos for that audience. And in your case, you're such a perfect mix for like guys 40 and over who, are, who have type 2 diabetes, who need to lose 50 pounds or more. You would just kill it, just documenting exactly what you did. It would be so easy for you to do it. I think you would be great at it. Be great. And you're a nice guy. I think you would kill it. You do incredible. You do better than me. You probably blow right by me with 100,000 subs like in no time. Let's see. Good. Okay. Good trip for you. Good trip for you on the fish oil. I still take it as well. We'll stop it and focus more on sardines and raw, raw herring too. That's another good traditionally here. And yeah, herring is great too. Definitely. Mike, any suggestions for getting rid of high blood pressure? Really interesting high blood pressure. It runs in my family too. Sometimes I get white coat syndrome myself. I go to the doctor, my blood pressure is high. Not crazy high, but a little high. Then I go to my buddy who's my, I, so I've done this like twice already where I drive right to his office. He's my chiropractor friend. He takes my blood pressure and it's normal. So I get nervous in front of, in front of um, doctors for some reason. I don't like going to doctors couple of things like just increasing nitric oxide is a great thing for lowering blood pressure because the vasodilates always every, everything up so doing like what I talk about eating like arugula and and eating like beetroot and, and beetroot and, and doing things like that can help you know exercise healthy lifestyle can really help some people feel um, cutting back on carbohydrates eating a low carb diet can really really help with blood pressure. And Peter Atia talks about uric acid a lot, and he's one of the only ones I heard her talking about that. He thinks there's a direct correlation between having high uric acid, like in, from your blood work, even if it's borderline high, I think the number is five, like he wants people like way below five, where I think the normal range is like in the fives. And I had one client who was like 5.5, I think, who lowered it and he, he, and he went off his blood pressure medication. So look into uric acid, healthy lifestyle obviously, potassium, magnesium, you know, there was that famous book, The Dash Diet. I'm not crazy about the diet because it's more of a high carb type diet, but they believed in eating foods high in um, calcium, high in potassium, and high in magnesium. There's definitely something to do with that too. Like I, I would probably just stick to more, I would lose weight, which is that will definitely help you lose. You go down to that 175 pounds, that might just do it. I would eat a, di I would eat a relatively low carb diet, take in your fruits and vegetables, eat high potassium, high magnesium, taking a good amount of calcium, you know, not go crazy with the calcium, but have it like a Greek yogurt or so like every single day. And then just like when you're eating sardines, you're getting the bone from the sardines. The omega-3s is good eating the oil, you know, the oily um, fish, maybe doing arugula salad every single day to make sure you're getting enough nitrates which convert to nitric oxide. L-citrulline, not only is L-citrulline good for like erect stronger erections and mild to moderate erectile dysfunction, also good for lowering blood pressure. There's a couple of other things that have shown to help lower blood pressure is um, hibiscus tea. There's some studies saying that eating three cups of strong hibiscus tea, that's that red tea, the flowery tea, really good for lowering blood pressure. Even flaxseed, you have to take a lot of it though. There's one incredible study I read. I read about, I'm familiar with the stuff. I did some videos on it years ago because both my parents have high blood pressure. They, they take medicine there, it's under control. But um, you gotta do like two tablespoons of ground flaxseed can really lower blood pressure as well too. Um, and just healthy lifestyle, it's really manageable. I mean, if you, and it's interesting, I'm gonna go back to this Peter Atiyah guy. Peter Atiyah had another a cardiologist on there. I'm not sure if he was a cardiologist or a kidney doctor, because I mean, both of them deal with blood pressure a lot. And he was saying that if your blood pressure is 140 over 90 or less, he would not medicate you. Peter Atiyah didn't agree, because Peter Atiyah is always looking to go beyond even what's good like he doesn't even think 120 over 80 is good. He wants it lower because he wants people living into their 120s, whatever. But this doctor who specialized in blood pressure, and that's like all he did. He's saying, you know, if someone comes to them and deals with me and they're 140 over 90 or less, I wouldn't medicate them. You know, in Europe and everything, different parts of the world, you know, they allow your blood pressure to go a little bit higher. Um, you know, I'm not a doctor. I want to be 100% clear with that. So talk about it with your doctor. 
but try those things. I mean, I think there's something to it. Okay, let's see what else. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, my doctor, this is Jeff. My doctor recommend the calamari, calamari oil because it has the highest concentration of DHA. Okay, maybe gotta, I to be truthful, Jeff, I'm really totally not familiar with that. I have to look at it. You know, I have to look at that. It's the EPA and DHA. I know that, I mean, I mean, those are the, that's what you really want. But hey, it could be great, you know. Okay. Um, olive oil extract is recommended by Volta Longo. What's your thought on that? No, I love, um, I know it's interesting because olive oil extract also is another one of those supplements that is good for lowering blood pressure. Is that what Volta Longo said? Because I remember I used to take that years ago. I just stopped taking it. I, I, I consume so much olive oil, but the, the extract of that obviously is a little more concentrated. I used to take, I used to take the, the Gali, G-A-I-L-E, something I think brand. I really like that brand a lot too. Salmon, gosh, oh, salmon roe is good. Yeah, salmon roe, you know, I agree. I love that. I love that. Okay. Okay. This is Chris. I want to help people, but I also want to make some extra money. I'm just not sure where to start with the nutrition. You know, Chris, I would, I, I don't, I wouldn't overthink it. I mean, not that it frustrates, and I'm not talking about you that frustrates me, but I look at, you know, sometimes I say, oh my, I've been doing this for years. I only got 15,000 followers. And then I see other people who have like talk about intermittent fasting, who have no nutritional background, have no fitness background, didn't own a gym like me for 35 years. And they, and they're more, more like, um, they just lost 50 pounds doing intermittent fasting or doing the OMAD, like the OMAD queen. I, I'm just making that up. I'm sure there is. I'm sure someone uses that handle, the OMAD queen, who lost 50 pounds in intermittent fasting. And they got 200,000 subscribers and they're killing it. There's a guy that I follow a little bit because when I do my videos, um, like what I eat in a day, like what I ate, you know, when I put on Instagram, there's a guy who, who does the OMAD diet. He's got like 200,000 views and all he does is make these videos of himself like, what I ate today on the Yomad diet. And he's not even eating healthy. You know, he's like, you know, he goes to like Wendy's. Oh, I had chili and a baked potato. And then I had, then on the way home within my hour, I stopped and I had a Carvel cone. And then I had these like, these nacho chips. And, you know, he's in a calorie deficit. So he lost so much weight, but he's killing it. You know, so in your case, Chris, I think you're much more sophisticated than him because you really follow a lot of different people and you really know a lot of stuff. But I think you would do incredibly well just documenting exactly what you did. And you have proof too, you can even show your blood work. You can show where you started. I mean, so many people will relate to your story more than even me, because people, some people look at me and say, you know, I really never, I mean, I, I've been, I never really was overweight. I mean, I bet obviously I didn't always have like a six pack, but I've always been a fitness person my whole life, you know, so you have the before and after. Like it would be hard for me to even find a before picture of myself. Maybe when I was like maybe a teenager, I probably was a little overweight, but I just ate anything I wanted, but I was lifting weights like crazy when I was like 17, 18 even. I think you can do incredibly well just documenting what you did without being scientific, without being, most, you know, it's interesting because I hired a, a YouTube coach one time. Um, what's his name? Brian Johnson, really nice guy. And he always kept on telling me, Mike, will you stop talking about the science? He said, you lose me in the first 15 seconds. As soon as you, he didn't even want me to use the term like protocol. He said, stop saying protocol. <laughs> you know, he said, don't mention glycogen. Stop saying autophagy. Don't, you know, I mean, you, you're going to lose people. But I always wanted, I mean, I'm not like science, like a Peter Atiyah or Andrew Huberman, but I'm also not just someone who's like lost 50 pounds and just by eating one meal a day. You know, I feel like I'm, in the middle to the little higher on the sciencey side, you know? So I think you can do incredibly well, Chris, just documenting exactly how you lost 65 pounds and how you reverse type two diabetes and just start. Don't overthink it. Truthfully, I probably, in your case, I probably, it seems like the easiest way, like like TikTok, I've got 64,000 followers. I didn't even do anything on TikTok. All I do is, I would probably start with shorts do 60 second or less videos, post, do YouTube shorts, shorts, Instagram shorts, TikTok shorts. Start documenting how you lost all the 65 pounds. Put some before and after pictures, I think you'll kill it. And, and you'll start making some money. You'll, you'll do much better than me, I'm sure. 
Yeah, go, Chris. Do it. No, I agree. I'm gonna help you any way I can, but I think you can definitely, you definitely can do it. Yeah, start with that, Chris. Just start doing those 60 second short Instagram, TikTok, YouTube shorts, even Facebook Reels, 60 seconds. Document how you do it. Simple. Keep it short, right to the point. 60 minutes. And show you got a nice personality. Show your personality in the videos. That's what people want. That's where all the experts, whenever I hire a console, and I've, I've, I've done so many, they say, Mike, you know, keep it really simple. Show more of your personality. I feel like my personality comes across much better when I do these live streams. When you look at my videos, I think I'm a little flat. Maybe I'm too sciencey. Maybe I'm too, like, boring. <clears throat> Everyone tells me, tell stories, you know. You want to have the hero story. Like, you're the hero, Chris. You know, you lost all this weight. Tell your story. You probably got a thousand stories you can tell. Tell about a difficult day and how, how, what made you decide you wanted to lose the weight. And, you know, just day by day, how you did it. You'll do so well. Uh, thanks, Mike. You're awesome. Oh, I really appreciate it. Love from England. Oh, England. That's why, that's why I'm dying to go to England. I went to the Channel Islands once, but I've never really spent time in London. I'd love, to, I'd love to go. It's interesting. A lot of people follow me from the UK, which I really like. Mike, what's the label? Oh, I, you know, it's, I trade so many. It's interesting. I try not to name. To, I still have confident, confidentiality, confidentiality agreements with a number of um, famous people. A lot of the famous people though I train too are like Wall Street guys and gals that are on CNBC, things like that. But the, one of the first personal training gyms I worked in was um, a guy named Hanson Fitness in Green Street in Soho. And this is back in like, oh my God, 1987, right after the crash, 1988. And every, it was one of those gyms, it, this is when new, personal training was um, so new in New York. And it was all celebrities from Tom Cruise to, I never, you know, he was right next, you know, it's just, it's so many celebrities and supermodels. But I have trained a number of, there's a couple of people I train right now that if I said their name, you would know them instantly. But I try not to, I try not to talk about it. I think that's one of the reasons why they like me, and I never really had like um, a celebrity go said, "Mike, let's do something together, and let's really help me." You know, like really, really help me and pop me to the next level. I just, I just, it, it never happened to me like that. But you know, but you know, some people say, "Oh, Mike, I don't believe you," but I, I've changed. I've changed. You know, if, if you've been a personal trainer as long as me in New York for over thirty-five years, I was the first generation personal trainer, like literally. Like when I first started working in gyms in, 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 the, in the 80s, the personal training didn't exist. There was no such thing as personal training. It started hitting New York maybe 1985, 1986 to some degree, and then Body by Jake, you know, was a New York guy who went to California. He was only a personal trainer for like a year and a half, then he started going into more the business end of it. You know, you just, you, it, it, so many celebrities wanted personal trainers. You just, it was almost not hard not to train a celebrity in a way, if you're in the city as a personal trainer, you know? You should have way more views. Your content is great, and you're a sincerely nice guy. Oh, I really appreciate it. Thanks. I'd, li I'd like to have some more views. <laughs> okay. Having many followers is not um, correlated with good content. You know, I agree too, but I, it, it, it gets a little frustrating for me. It's often other factors. Uh, Ray Mears is very knowledgeable regarding survival, but he's not sensational. Yeah, I know. It's interesting. It, it's such an. It's such a so hard to figure it out. Exactly. Tell your own story, Chris. I totally agree. I've learned so. Okay. I've learned so much from you. Um, I think you're one of the best. Oh, then I really appreciate it, Chris. And and you can do it. No question about it. All right, guys. How long are we going? An hour eighteen. I'm probably gonna go take my 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 fasted walk. I drank way too much espresso today. I'm actually feeling it. I think I had like one too many. <clears throat> I really appreciate everybody showing up, Chris. You can definitely do it. Yeah. Thanks so much for the super chat. Have a wonderful week, guys. You know, if you can, give me some ideas for um, you know what you, what, what you want me to talk about um, next week. Oh, you know, you know what's interesting. Um, I was going to talk. Ah, now nah, we'll we'll do it next time. I like ghost stories. <laughs> That's what you're, I like that. Thanks, Mike. Lots of good info again. Well, great to see everyone. I appreciate you, everyone sharing sharing my trip with you. It was it was a lot of fun. And thanks for showing up. And I'll see everybody next week. Take care, everyone. Yep. Bye bye.